Grace and peace be unto you, children of God, from our Father and from the Lord Jesus the Christ. You know, I always thank our God on your behalf for his grace which is given to you by Jesus, that in all things you're enriched by him as the word of God transforms you, so you won't be lacking in any gift. Welcome to the Master's Touch Masterclass. professor Dr. Stephanie and these classes are designed to give you a firm foundation in the Word of God. I am going to take you from the beginning to your eternal beginning in depth in God's Word revealing his plan and purpose for your life, how he mapped it out, why he designed it that way and into who you are in Christ, what power you have, why you have it and how to operate in it as God designed for you to. You won't want to miss any of these classes. However, if you can't make it to the virtual classroom or the broadcast, then know that these are archived for your study convenience. And they'll, you'll find them on Spreaker.com, you'll find them on Ustream.tv, and on the, the masterstouch.org, which is our uh, website, themasterstouch.org. All right. So God bless you richly, my friends. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts flowing through our lips. We exalt and praise you in your holy name. Lord, we thank you for the hearts and minds that are hungering for you and your word and to know your will. We praise you for our Lord and Savior, your only Son, Jesus the Christ, and his finished work on the cross on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for revelation knowledge, your rhema word, and the gift of utterance. Bless those that have ears to hear, Lord, as you impart wisdom through your word. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now, my friends, did you come expecting to receive today? If not, you won't receive anything from God. That's what the Word of God says. Elevate your expectation level, and you will come away with greater head and heart knowledge from anything and everything that you ever do. And that includes in the natural. <laughs> Now we're moving deeper into the Word of God as we learn about being in Christ. Today we will be taking a continued look at entering God's rest and as we discover how and why to be diligent to enter God's rest. Therefore, let us fear lest while a promise remains of entering His rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. For indeed we have good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word that they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said, as I swore in my, my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has thus said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. You know, if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. There remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience. Okay, chapter 3 ended with the warning that it was unbelief that kept the people of Israel from entering into the promised land and re the rest that God had promised there. In verse 19 it says, And we, and so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. This, the point that we draw from this is that we must care enough about each other that every day we get involved in each other's lives and exhort each other not to let uh, distrust in God creep in and destroy our lives. We actually get this from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. Take care, brethren, lest there should be any one of you, uh, any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. But encourage anyone, encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So the conclusion to draw from the chapter, chapter 3, verse 19 warning is that unbelief is such a constant and dangerous temptation that we must help each other fight it off. Now, uh, we're picking up where we left off the other day, uh, in just a second when I find it. <laughs> and, um, oh dear me, let's see. Well, I'm not being able to find it right now, so I'll, I'll just go on and go where I think that we, that we, left off. Well, persevering in faith to, end, to the end is a community project. 
Yes. Small groups should have a tremendous seriousness about them, my friends, if you believe that what, it's, what this says. What's the progression? Well, we meet and form relationships of mutual accountability and love because of our faith, and our faith depends on that. And our entering into God's rest depends on our faith. Okay, so that's the progression. Now, at the beginning of chapter 4, the writer draws another conclusion from the warning of 319. He says, therefore... That's the sign that he's drawing a conclusion from what he just said in 319. Let us fear lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. What's his conclusion? Well, he gathered from the fact that uh, Israel was not able to enter God's rest that it was because of unbelief. His conclusion then is that we should fear. What? Fear what? Fear lest any one of you should come short of God's rest, which is the restful haven of salvation, by the way. That is fear so that you won't even appear to have missed heaven. Because if you go on in this way, you will miss it. Yes, 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 yes. That's the outcome of fearing, not coming short of God's rest. But what is that that we fear then? Well, the connection with verse 19 surely tells us the thing we are to fear is unbelief. Verse 19, they were not able to enter God's rest because of their unbelief. Therefore, fear that unbelief because that... That's what will keep you from entering God's rest, God's haven of salvation and God's heaven. Fear unbelief. Fear not believing God. Fear not trusting God. You can see this confirmed if we just keep on reading into verse 2. Notice that verse 2 begins with for, the word for. That means that he is giving a reason for verse 1, a reason for why they should fear. Fear, he says in verse 1, for indeed we have good news preached to us just as they did. All right. Had they had the good news preached to them, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. So, he continues to compare Israel's situation in the wilderness to the situation of believers in his day. Excuse me, <clears throat> in his day. They had good news preached to them, and we have had good news preached to us too. What was the good news that was preached to them? Well, among many other things, it was God's word to Israel from Mount Sinai in Exodus 34, 6 through 7. Listen to this. Then the Lord proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow and to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who give, forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. It was good news of love and mercy and forgiveness of every kind of iniquity and transgression and sin, and it was the good news of God's promise that God would bring them into the land of milk and honey. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> And he'd be with them if they would just trust him and not rebel. All right. Numbers 14, 8 through 9. So this writer says that the Israelites had heard the gospel just like uh, his readers had. Not the foundation uh, of it in the death and the resurrection of Christ, but, which our readers have heard. But still the promise that God is merciful and forgives sins and promises rest and joy for those who trust him. So we see that there is a similar situation between Israel and the readers of this letter. The point is, this good news was not believed by Israel, and so they did not enter God's rest. God's promised joy. Verse 2, the word they heard, the good news of forgiveness and promised joy, did not profit them, because it was not united by faith to the, in those who heard. In other words, they didn't believe it. They doubted God. They distrusted him. They did not have faith in his promise to give them a better future than they had in Egypt, and so they gave up on God and wanted the old life. And what was the result of that unbelief? Verse 2 says the promise did not profit them. It was of no value to them. It did not save them. As 3.19 says, they did not enter God's rest. They fell in the wilderness, and God swore in his wrath that they would never enter his rest. This is a picture of missing heaven, my friends. So the point of verse 2 is exactly the same as the point of 3.19. It's a reason for why we should fear unbelief. Verse 19, they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, verse 1, fear, unbelief, because verse 2, when the good news to Israel was not united in faith, it profited them nothing and they perished in the wilderness. So here's the main point. Fear this happening to you. Fear hearing the promises of God and not trusting them, because the same thing will happen to us as happened to them. And what is that? We will not enter into God's rest, God's heavenly haven, if we don't trust him, if we don't believe his promises. Okay, that's the main point of the paragraph, fear unbelief. In the last sentence of the paragraph, he says the same thing in different words. Verse 11, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience. In other words, Israel fell from the promised jo uh, joy of God because of the disobedience of unbelief. 
The same thing can happen to any professing Christian. So how do we keep it from happening? How do we show that we are more than mere professing Christians? Paul says, be diligent to enter God's rest, God's heavenly haven. Be diligent. Pay close attention to what you've heard. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Don't neglect your great salvation. Chapter 2, verse 3. Consider Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 1. Do not, con heart do not harden your hearts. Chapter 3, verse 8. Take care against an unbelieving heart. Chapter 3, verse 12. Exhort one another every day against the deceitfulness of sin. Chapter 3, verse 14. And fear the unbelief that will keep you from your promised rest. 4-1. All right. Can you see the great lesson here? The Christian life is a life of day-by-day, hour-by-hour trust in the promises of God to help us and guide us and take care of us and forgive us and bring us into a future of holiness and joy that will satisfy our hearts infinitely more than if we forsake Him and put our trust in ourselves or in the promises of this world. So, <clears throat> that day-by-day, hour-by-hour trust in God's promises is not automatic, dear ones. It's the result of daily diligence, and it's the result of proper fear. So let me ask you, do we live in a constant fear of, feeling, of, of being lost? Well, ponder this fear with me for a minute. You may be asking, you mean the ideal Christian life is lived in constant fear of being lost? Be cautious here. Be sure you don't ask that question of me as though it were my theology that you were in doubt, that was in doubt, will put you in doubt. <laughs> Why did I say that? Because it's Hebrews 4.1, written to holy brethren. That commands, therefore, let us fear. And Hebrews 4.1 is not unique in the New Testament. Jesus said in Luke 12.5, Fear the one who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Paul said in Philippians 2.13, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He says in Romans 11.20, You stand fast only through faith, so do not become conceited, but fear. Okay, be cautious how you question this truth. It's God's word, not my word, that says the Christian is to fear. So then, with all humility and openness, we ask God, are we supposed to live our lives in fear of missing heaven? Well, first of all, remember chapter 2, verse 15, Christ died uh, to deliver those who, through fear of death, were subject to slavery in all, all their lives. Loud and clear, Christ died to deliver us from slavish fear. Christ wants a fearless people. Christ wants a people who live in the most dangerous neighborhoods without fear, who go to the unreached peoples behind um, uh, closed doors without fear, who speak to neighbors without fear, uh, about Christ, that is, you know. How? By faith in his promises. <laughs> faith is the promises of God. Faith in the promises of God makes you fearless before the threats of men. Hebrews 10.34 so there's only one thing to fear, faithlessness, right? So if you have faithlessness, then you better be afraid. Fear unbelief in the promises of God, because as long as you're trusting in the promises of God, you can be utterly fearless in the face of anything, even death, even God. See, see uh, chapter 4, verse 16. Now, what is this like? Your children uh, know what it's like. When you were real little, your mother and father said very firmly, don't ever run out in the street. Always hold my hand. Why? It's dangerous in the street. You could be killed by a car. In other words, fear running out in the street. But did that mean that you couldn't have fun in the backyard and on the sidewalk and in the parks? No. In fact, most of the time, you never even thought about how fearful the street was. Only when you got near the street and made, uh, maybe when your ball rolled out in the street or, and you had to go after it, or, or maybe somebody tempted you with, to run across the street when you weren't supposed to, only then did you feel the fear of, of the street. The rest of the time, the fear kept you playing in places where you didn't have to feel any fear at all. That's the way it is with the fear of unbelief. You don't live with constant trepidation. You only experience that when there are temptations to distrust God's promises. And even then, you use that fear feeling to send you running into the safe yard of God's goodness and promises. So normal Christian life is aware of the fearful danger of unbelief, but doesn't live paralyzed or terrorized by it. Why? Because the normal Christian life lives in faith. Fear only rises when faith starts to weaken, and it only rises long enough to get us back into the peaceful fearlessness of faith. Now, the Bible tells us that there was a place of rest for God's people. There's one more thing I want to do with this text. Verses 3 through 10 are written to support the main point, which we have looked at in verses 1 and 11. Namely, be diligent to enter God's rest and fear lest you fail to enter it because of unbelief. Now, the way verses 3 through 10 support this um, main point is by showing from the Old Testament that there is a rest to enter into. Uh, 
That is, that God has a plan for his people to join him in the wonderful restfulness of his heavenly haven, where all weariness and burdensomeness will be lifted. Come to me, all you la who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus said that in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Verses 3 through 10 are written to show that this promise is really there in the Old Testament. The text is very complicated, so let me just sketch a very brief outline for you. The writer focuses on five points in history to show how God keeps opening his rest for believing people. <clears throat> First, he starts at creation, Genesis 2-2, and says in verse 4, He has thus said, somewhere concerning the seventh day, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So he sees in this a restful, peaceful, sovereign God who has a rest and a peace and a place of joy where his people can enjoy fellowship with him. He will call it a Sabbath rest. Why? Because on the seventh day God rested. However, in reality, it lasts forever. Second, he focuses on the period when Israel was wandering in the wilderness and rebelling against God. Verse 5, quoting Psalm 95. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. I'm um, not enter my rest. The promised land is a picture of God's ultimate rest, and their unbelieving rebellion excludes them from it, which raises the question whether they're there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. The third focus is on the time of Joshua, who took the people into the promised land. Now let me ask you, is that the final ultimate rest that God had in mind for his people? Well, verse 8 answers no. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. In other words, even though Joshua gave some relief to the people of God in the promised land, that was not the final rest that God, uh, uh, that, that, that God had planned for them. How do we know that? Well, God spoke of another day, another rest centuries later. My brethren, today there is still is a resting place, which brings us to the fourth period of time the writer focuses on, the time of David, writing in Psalm 95, verse 7. He again fixes a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as that has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. In other words, long after the people enjoyed the rest of the promised land, David says that God is still holding out to his people and an offer of salvation rest. Don't harden your hearts and you will enjoy God's rest. Psalm 95.11, Hebrews 3.11, and Hebrews 4.3. From, from this, the writer draws the all-important conclusion about God's Sabbath rest of salvation, and this is his fifth period of history, namely today. Verse 9, there remains therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. In other words, today the rest is still open, and that is the foundation of God's message to you. There is a rest open to you today, and God offers rest. The door is not shut. The time is not passed by. You have not missed your last opportunity. Here are the words of verse 9. There remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. The door is open, my friends. The time is now. Uh, but someone says, yes, a rest remains for the people of God, but not for me. My answer, don't rule yourself out. Look at verse 3, our last word. We who have believed enter that rest. There is one door to the safe, place, peaceful, happy rest of God, and that door of faith. Anyone who puts faith in God's promises bought us, bought for us by the blood of Jesus uh, and is diligent not to throw that faith away is a part of the people of God. So on behalf of God, I call you this morning to put your trust in the promise of God's rest. And I pray that you have received this. Um, if you have questions or need further assistance with understanding these uh, messages, please contact me. I can be reached at masterstouchhs at cox.net, poet at cox.net, or mthsprayer at cox.net. I invite you to join us for the Master's Touch class, Master Class every Monday at and Tuesday at 10 a.m. and again on Thursday at 3 p.m. You know what? You're going to enjoy a complete Bible college ministry level study on discipleship into being in Christ. I want you to understand that this discipleship is not into a denomination or church doctrine. I'll be teaching you true discipleship into the body of Christ. And although these, although these classes are on a ministerial level, they are for everybody, every believer. We're going to begin at the beginning of creation and move all the way into your salvation and the gifts of the cross given to you by Christ. Your purpose in God having, uh, God's having created you and your, and your call. How to step into that calling, what to expect when you do, and what to expect when you don't. Now the power you have, how to operate in it, and why you have it, 
and is there too, and we're going to finish up not with the end, but with our true and eternal beginning. So don't miss any of these classes. However, if you can't meet with us at the time of your bro our broadcast, we will be archiving these classes after each broadcast on Spreaker.com and also on the masterstouch.org. That's our website, and they'll be there for you to study and enjoy. So don't you think it's time that you understood your purpose, what you're doing here? Come join us every Monday and Tuesday at 10 a.m. and Thursday at 3 p.m. Pacific Time, and come expecting to receive. The Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International is now conducting worship services on Sundays, every Sunday at 8 a.m. on Ustream.tv. These are complete worship services that include praise and worship, soaking worship, the Word of God, Holy Communion, and an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This all comes to you through a visitation from the Holy Spirit with the touch that you need from God. Come join me every Sunday at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on Ustream.tv for the Master's Touch Worship Service. And most importantly, come expecting to receive. Brethren, Proverbs 4, 7 tells us wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. And that's exactly what we are doing here, my friends. Gaining God's wisdom. Therefore, make sure you are keeping Jesus Lord of your life. The Master's Word is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We're a 501c3 organization. 1 John 4, 7 tells us that when we are in Christ, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. That's all I have for you today, and I hope you received it. If you have questions, contact me. God bless you, and um, I'll be talking to you later. Mm -hmm.